Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Angela Scott, and I'm the library assistant here at the Billie Jean King Main Library's Miller Special Collections Room. On behalf of our senior librarian, Jade, Whale uh, Jade Wheeler, our special collections librarian, Jeff Whalen, and all the staff here at the Long Beach Public Library, I'd like to welcome you to the second online event of the Miller Room's new Artist Workshop series. Today, we are very pleased to bring you a special event moderated by comic book writer, Mike Wellman, with a special guest panel of comic book artists and writers. This is one of a series of programs that will be featured periodically in the Miller Room throughout the year, in addition to a variety of lecture series on local history, architecture and historic preservation, the spoken word, as well as our poetry and fiction writing workshops, our Miller Room book club and short story reading group, art programming, musical performance programs, and much more. Please keep an eye on our LBPL calendar and website for upcoming events, and we hope you'll join us again for more of these special programs as they become available. Now, while we have you all here, we'd also like to mention some upcoming Miller Room programming for October. On Tuesday, October 19th from 5.30 to 7 p.m., please join us for our next Miller Room Book Club meeting. We'll be reading the 2004 New York Times bestselling nonfiction book, The Devil in the White City, Murder, Magic, and Madness at the Fair that Changed America by Eric Larson, a creepy true crime story based around the 1893 Chicago World's Fair just in time for Halloween. Now, the Miller Room Book Club reads a rotating selection of fiction and nonfiction books, as well as short stories that generally focus on the Miller Room study topics and special collections relating to the arts and performing arts, Asian culture and heritage, local and California history, libraries and archives, and much more. This book club is currently meeting online via Zoom, and pre-registration RSVPs are necessary. So keep an eye on our LBPL website at lbpl.org or our Facebook page for more details as the book club meetings will be posted there soon for advanced signups. You can also message me here in the live chat if you have questions or call the main library for further details. In addition, we're pleased to resume in-person programming for the fall as we launch our next arts and culture lecture series event on Saturday, October 30th from 2 to 4 p.m. entitled Music and the Movies exploring the creepy collaboration of screen legend Alfred Hitchcock and composer Bernard Herrmann. For nice. more information, keep an eye on our website and our event calendar and Facebook page for the Zoom program, or this in-person program, I'm sorry, which will be posted next week for advanced signups. And please stay tuned for other Miller Room programs that will be rolling out in the next few months. And then finally, please stop by the Miller Room on the first and third Fridays of the month from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m to enjoy our new drawing and coloring club for adults, a fun adults only opportunity to unwind and enjoy sketching, coloring, and listening to relaxing music while socializing and meeting new friends. A variety of coloring sheets and coloring pencils will be provided, though visitors are welcome to bring your own coloring books, sketchbooks, and colored pencils as well. No registration is required to attend and walk-in visitors are welcome and social distancing will be observed. Again, if you'd like to learn more, keep an eye on our website for more details coming soon. Now, getting back to our program for today. It is our pleasure to once again welcome and introduce our special guest moderator for our program this afternoon, Mike Wellman. Mike has been a comic book writer and creator for 20 years and a comic shop retailer for 28. His comic book worlds include Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, World of Warcraft, as well as his own creations, Mac Afro, Gone South, and Guns a Blazin, to name a few. He's worked in a string of comic book stores before co-founding The Comic Bug in 2004, and then opening Atomic Basement Comics here in downtown Long Beach in 2020. Yes. He brings the unique perspective of having worked as both a retailer and a creator, as well as an educator at Otis College of Arts and Design, and at schools and libraries all over the Southern California area. Welcome, Mike. Hey, you guys are about to see something amazing that doesn't happen a lot uh, in 2021. I'm about to make uh, one, two, three, five dollars. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> right We're having okay. a side sale. It's Grand Prix down here in Long Beach. I don't know if you can hear the roaring engines or not. I haven't heard them, but... Um, but yeah, so I, I put a bunch of books on the sidewalk and uh, it, and they're moving. 
<laughs> and they're the moving. Best, That's the great. Way to, uh, get customers in your store is to uh, <laughs> apparently do a podcast because, like, nor- I've been sitting here twiddling my thumbs all day. You, you can get me the rest later, bro. It's, it's okay. 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 Yeah. Well, speaking I'll, I'll of speak. moving, I'm going to move right along to our next group of special <laughs> guests for our discussion today. Um, thank you. Thank you. Rafael Navarro, Don Nguyen, and Christy Shen. Uh, so for over 20 years, Rafael Navarro has been working as a gun for hire artist in the diverse fields of animation, illustration, and comic books. And he's earned a daytime Emmy, Emmy as well as two other Emmy nominations for outstanding special class in an animated program. He is also a recipient of the Xerox mm-hmm. Foundation Award. And as a story artist, he specializes in action and adventure, but finds comfort in any genre, whether it's action, adventure, sitcom, cartoons, or even surreal. His only purpose is to always tell a good story, no matter what medium it's in. His comic book projects include Gumby's Gang, starring Pokey, Bella Lugosi's Tales from the Grave, as well as the Zurich award-winning cult classic Sonambulo a Lucha Libre film noir creation, being published in various languages, including Spanish, French, and Croatian. His latest book, Guns Ablazin, a science fiction Western co-created with writer Mike Wellman, has now become a revered classic in the world of independent comics. His clients have included Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, Warner Brothers, Nickelodeon, Mattel, and Technicolor, Comedy Central and Lego, just to name a few. And his show credits also include The Batman, Scooby-Doo, Spectacular Spider-Man, Rugrats, Mucha Lucha, Lego's Hero Factory, Barbie, Shaolin Showdown, Wacky Races, and many more. Welcome, Raphael. Thank you. Now, Don Wynn is our designer, is a designer, comic book, and storyboard artist based in Los Angeles. He created Pablo the Gorilla, Jupiter the Space Pug, and co-created Kindle number one Inktober book, Siren Song, with writer Andy Nordwall. He designed the BLM Skull Fist for Punisher, co-creator Jerry Conway's Skulls for Justice Black Lives Matter fundraiser, and he was a sketch card artist for Marvel Upper Deck's inaugural Marvel anime trading card set, alongside superstars Peach Momoko and Ray Anthony Height. His work has been featured in the Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, ScreenRant.com, and BoingBoing.net. Welcome, Don. Thank you for joining us. And finally, last but not least, our wonderful Christy Shin is an illustrator and comic artist who lives in the city of Los Angeles as well. She likes drawing nasty, gross (laughs) things about people she cannot stand. And her and comics yeah. include the titles Demon Bitch, Sepulchre, and Personal Monsters. And she is a win- winner of the Ringo Award. She also hosts a lunch hour most days on Monday through Friday from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on Facebook Live, Twitch, and YouTube. Welcome, Christy, and thank you, all of you, you, for joining us today. We're really looking forward to getting started. And then just finally, one last comment. During the program, please feel free to type in any questions or comments in the chat bar that you'd like to share with Mike or other uh, special guest panelists. For those who may not be familiar with the chat feature, you'll see a chat button at the bottom of your screen. Click on it and you can type and submit your questions there. Q&A during the program will be moderated by me um, and uh, the other guests who are here will be available for answering questions. The program will officially end at 4.30 p.m. And we will be sending out an email in the coming week or so with a link to the archive video recording of this program so you can watch it later, later at your leisure as well. And if for some reason you have difficulty with your audio or video during the program, please let us know in the chat so we can try to assist you remotely. All right, so thank you again for joining us, everyone. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the Miller Room is very pleased to present our very special guests, Mike Wellman and friends. Hey guys, welcome. <laughs> uh, not really used to looking out into an empty crowd, but I'm gonna pretend you're there and I, I know you're there cybernetically. Uh, <laughs> They're also here in spirit, apparently. Exactly. Angela, Angela, look, lo and behold. 
So, <laughs> okay, there you go. So when you put together a panel, uh, you got to be careful. You don't want to put too many people on the panel because you want to give people room to breathe and room to talk. And speaking of that, uh, we want to focus heavily on Miss Christy Shen because I know she's got to leave a little bit early, I think. So uh, uh, yeah. we'll give her a little more attention than, than everybody else. Don't get jealous, uh, Raph and Don. <laughs> but uh, but I, I've, uh, I selected this group of uh, creators uh, because I think that they each, well, we're all independent for one, and we knew we wanted to do something that was an independent focused uh, uh, forum for comic book creating. Uh, they also each have a very different approach to how they make comics and how they uh, further their careers, as they say. Um, how they put their careers out there. And uh, I, I think that we can learn, I can learn even uh, something from what each of them has to offer. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start with Christy. Because like I said, she's got to bounce early and we want to, you know, put her in the hot seat, as it were. Because <laughs> like, you know, when she answers the question, then we can all be thinking how to sound cool. Um uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but Christy, uh, she is a very unique individual uh, creator, uh, and I dare say friend in my life. Um, she cracks everybody up. Anybody who spends, you know, five minutes with her, like, she, she's no holds barred, um, <laughs> hence the title of her comic. Um, and, uh, but... On top of that, she also like curates fine art galleries and and does you know just crazy things like and she's a foodie and my girlfriend loves her and they go get ramen together and stuff. Um, so Christy, what made you decide? Were you a, a fine artist or were you a comic book artist first or both at the same time? Oh, it, it started off as like a fine art fine art graphic artist. Like I decided mm -hmm. to kind of go out and break into the world. And how I decided to make money initially was, you know, graphic design, you know, that's like, okay, more utilitarian. And in the meantime, I can go build up my illustration, which mm -hmm. I did. And then I graduated to comic art. Now I did it kind of started doing it about 10 years ago, but I was just trying to practice and I didn't have the rig that I had now. And uh, when I first drew, they said, oh, well, and I was kind of getting into the whole, like, how to do comics and introduce yourself into them. Um, I was in Santa Barbara at the time, so it's kind of quiet. And they said, oh, do a DC page. And I did it and it sucked. So, you know, don't even <laughs> ask about that. But I just said, OK, fine. And then but as time grew on and then I moved down to L.A., I found out there's a lot more avenues to do comics and independent comics. Mm -hmm. And with the advent of technology, not only did I get a better rig, like I have a surface right now that I'm talking on that I'll probably draw on simultaneously later. But also, you know, I have a Wacom tablet that I draw directly on that makes it easier for drawing and editing. And I had been really into independent comics for the past like 20 some odd years, if that dates me. Uh, I like to get into the Hernandez brothers. And then it was more of like I got into Johnny Ryan. Now, Johnny Ryan's not safe for kids or for work. So go from there. But, you know, like heavy metal, things like that. But then, like, I started getting really into indie comics because the flu it was more fluid, it was more free flowing. And with life experience, I came up with Demon Bitch, and it all just kind of came together and all that. So, De so Demon Bitch, it, uh, from what I remember of our conversations, uh, is, is somebody you knew. Yeah, I knew people, knew girls like that. And I know some people get mad at me. I've had other people kind of get mad at me, like, why girls? Well, it's like there's an unspoken thing that I just come out with is that if you're a woman, you have been badly burned by another woman. And I know guys, guys go like, well, I've been bad. Okay. It's not about you guys right now, but what it is <laughs> is that like girls can be really mean to each other. And that's like the elephant in the room. And even mm -hmm. though we're saying, Oh, solidarity and all that, it's like, no, there's a lot of girls that still backstab each other. And until we solve that problem and be honest about it, I mean, with a men's perspective, maybe too, but I'm just focusing on what I know, you know, right. we have to own up to that crap. And, um, you know, if we want to be better people. And so Demon Bitch was kind of based off of, it's kind of like uh, Matt Groening. He does The Simpsons. He did Life in Hell. Yeah. So I did Personal Monsters as the intro to the, um, to the universe of Demon Bitch because it was just basically the origin of the species, but for buttheads, right? But mm -hmm. then 
demon bitch kind of focused on one character that I knew, like of the women that I had met. And initially they seemed nice when I went to LA, but they turned out to be like really horrible drug addicts. And I don't mean that all drug addicts are bad people or people with mental illnesses <laughs> are bad people, but there are people that are jerks no matter what flag they fly under. And you yeah. have to like get that. And the thing is like this person, like I had met so many people that so many women that had like egregiously lied and just essentially like just did these uber dramatic things. And with the advent and the right and advent of social media, you know, it got worse. Like they would say, Oh, I got into an accident. And instead of writing, yeah, this is what happened. They basically kick, you know, they basically say, I went down the steps and I slipped and then all this other <laughs> stuff happened. And then my slipper flew across and I broke my foot in two places. I'm like, okay, just say you broke your foot in two places after slipping. Like, but you kind of know now, like as so social media has like dominated our perspective <clears throat> for 20 years, roughly. Um, I was there at the beginning of it. That still continues to date me, but it's like, it kind of has, re you kind of now recognize sort of the level of attention whoring some people get to. And that's, and especially with some women, it gets tiresome. Like people go on there, they screed and they say things like it's really important. And then they kind of go like, okay, I am a warrior now by what I did. Or I, everybody, I'm the star of my own melodrama. And it's like to a, to a certain point, I get that in life, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's to a point where it's really over petty stuff, really, honestly. And it's really not important. So for me, a lot of the time, I personally don't put too many personal things on my social media. I prefer to talk to friends personally, but I'll put stories. I'll put stuff that I'm doing up because for me, I'm pretty public as a figure. Um, as far as I know, I mean, I go to cons, people are getting more and more familiar with my work. So I have to go and put that part out there. Like, this is what I'm working on. This is what I'm working on. Maybe a few antidotes here and there about what I do. But other than that, you know, it's like, really, I think what people have forgotten over social media is like, we share what we choose to share. Yeah. Now, real quick, before we move on to Don, uh, do you find that your work with uh, Demon Bitch, has it provided a shield uh, for you against the kind of people you're talking about? I think it's a way of kind of, I don't want to say policing because that makes me no better, but it kind of just makes the person more aware. Like when they mm -hmm. see it, I never put names and I never put, like exactly like what they do or something, you know, in terms of like specifics, like where they live or anything. It's mm -hmm. more of like, I put certain actions that I find stupid up there, but I don't put their names or anything identifying as how they would in real life mm -hmm. because I want to give them a chance to change. You know, like this is the shipper personality. This is the demon bitch personality, stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know, and you can leave it behind. It can just live in its own little fetid pull of, fetid pool of like filth, mm -hmm. but you can go on, you can dump that. That's not you anymore. So that's how I feel about that um, in general. So I think in a way it's kind of funny. I was talking this over with actually ironically Mog earlier. And uh, I was saying that it's kind of funny because like a lot of the things that the artists complain about, like they don't respect my stuff. They put their drinks and food all over my stuff. And I said, that's funny. I never get that. But then again, some people say you have demon bitch. So it's kind of like, it makes you look evil or something like that. I'll be sure to do that at the next convention for you. So you don't feel left out. Okay. I am sure it'll be fine. <laughs> everything is waterproof anyway, over there. <laughs> Moving on to Don uh, real quick. Now Don, Don Wynn is one of the, uh, if not the most, but he's one of the most positive people uh, in comics that I know in independent comics. He, he, he's really a force of nature. I think he's extremely talented. Um, he's, he's, uh, in my experience, definitely a people pleaser. Um, hey, how's it going? Uh, and, uh, and he's just somebody like when you're around him, like you, you it, it kind of rubs off on you a little bit, you know, I mean, I should maybe spend more time around him. Um, but his, his comic is Pablo the gorilla and it's, I want to say, and I could be wrong. I could be going on a limb, but there's there there's like a hint of Hellboy in it, but it's not like Hellboy. It's like a a gorilla that just wants to deliver pizza. So he's got like a really simple goal in life, 
and and things keep getting in the way. So that's why I guess I compare it to Hellboy. Hellboy just kind of wants to get get by, but he just happens to be like the son of Satan or something like so that. He's a heck boy, as to heck boy. Hellboy. yeah, yeah. So Pablo's a heck boy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> God, <laughs> uh, what's up with the pizza, bro? Uh, so the joke that uh, is one of my pitches for Pablo the Gorilla is: Will it be the next? Ninja Turtles, uh, I'm not saying it's not going to be, but I'm not saying it is going to be. So mm-hmm. you'll just have to tune in to find out. Uh, I love Hellboy. I love Mike Mignola. He's a huge influence on me. And I think for Pablo the Gorilla, it's a, a, an amalgamation of all of my influences. I try to wear that on my sleeve. I talk about my uh, you know, the people who've impacted my art style and my, uh, you know, just my comic acumen, if you will, uh, all the time. Um, so, you know, Hellboy's in there, um, you know, James O'Barr with the Crow, Eastman Laird with the Ninja Turtles, uh, James Hewlett with Tank Girl, you know, just like Christy said, I, I think a lot of us uh, that are in indie comics and even comics in general, you know, we, we have such a love and respect for the medium and, uh, you know, that that's definitely in there, as well as some of the mainstream stuff, like if you read Pablo, I think you'll see some hints of uh, the Incredible Hulk and uh, some Spider-Man in there as well. Um, and you know, in terms of the character design, you'll also see a lot of pop influence of uh, the characters um, and the villains. Oh, looks like Mike has to entertain uh, some customers. But yeah, you know, just uh, in terms of what we do, I, I don't know if it's necessarily that I'm super positive or that I just don't know better. Uh, I, I think uh, when you get into the industry and you start putting that work and making work, uh, there, there's a certain amount of naivete that goes along with it, and I'd like to hold on to that and cherish it. And I think that's kind of uh, the perspective that I come from. And uh, I don't know if there are any people out in the audience that are looking to make comics, um, but you know, our, our our medium is so full of different styles and different ways of telling a story, and it's not you know, it's not about one thing or the other or like a house style for like Marvel or for DC or like you know, uh, you look at any of the indie publishers that are even you know like well respected and big like the fancy graphics. Uh, you know, like uh, Chrissy had mentioned earlier with uh, the Hernandez brothers, uh, um, so or you know, like Boom or IDW, the, the styles are changing, and even uh, you know, one of the, the biggest producers of comics within the last few years has been uh, Kickstarter and uh, crowdfunding campaigns, and, and you see that there's a market out there for different stories, uh, you know, for different funny books like i i used to think of comics as a very serious thing and now i love just saying that i'm here just to make funny books um because i think you know there there is a an intrinsic quality in comics that lends itself towards humor even in really dark moments um so yeah there's there's something for everybody i feel like and it's it's a special medium that that we operate and exist in and i i just love promoting i love finding new projects and meeting new creators and uh i I think you know having that community fostering it and growing it introducing it to younger uh audience um and and having you know just the next generation in line ready to create that that's gonna it it, you know it's part of not only pop culture but i think culture in general um you know we talk about the advent of comics to me that started with cave paintings right like the first comics are kind of just on walls with animals and uh yeah and and that's where the the narrative the idea of humans wanting to put up the narrative of uh what they experience i think comes from whether we tell that through you know an avatar like a pablo or a demon bitch you know with anecdotal stories uh, all the way to a superhero that's well known like a spider-man or superman I, i think a lot of creators carry or add just a certain amount of personification and personality that's within them to what they do. Yep. One of the things I respect about you and, and admire is because uh, I follow you on social media and, you know, I, I see when you're going to conventions and doing that, you know, you don't make it all about Don Wynn. You don't, you, I very rarely do you even talk about your creations. I, I have had to pull it out of you. <laughs> Um, when you're doing a show, you, you put together a map, uh, for, you know, 
who's going to be where, when they're going to be there, what their table is. Uh, you know, I, when somebody has a new Kickstarter or whatever, you're always promoting that on, on your page. And, and uh, again, like, and I, I think that a lot of us creators, we get to absorbed in ourselves, you know, and, and you're out there projecting, not just for yourself. Uh, I mean, every once in a while you do. And you do the, I mean, the, the BLM uh, uh, image was just spectacular. And thank you. You know, you should ride that all the way to to the grave. You know, um, <laughs> I mean, hopefully it'll be irrelevant at some point, right? But I would um, hope so. Yes. But uh, but no, you're you're really good about you know like promoting other creators. You want to speak to that or? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I think as I said before, you know, what what we do is community. But I also came into this this medium. A fan first. You know, I grew up with comics. I uh, I love I love comics. Uh, you know, I I discovered comics in a library for the very first time. I tell the story. Uh, you know, I was born and raised partly in uh, Seattle, Washington, and uh, you know, the first time I ever saw comics, my mom would go to the library to study, and uh, she would just drop me off in the kids section, and that's where I discovered uh, amazing comics like uh, Uncanny X-Men. I think John Byrne was having a run at that time. So, uh, you know, that, that really sticks in my mind. Uh, storm with the Mohawk will always be my storm. Um, I, you know, I, I grew up watching in syndication. They had the Batman 66 series. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't even know that those were comics. I just was like, oh, Batman's a character. And I think a lot of the public still, even in this day and age, don't realize where a lot of these characters that they see on screen come from um, that they originated in comics and that's that's where the story and the origins lie and to me yeah I you know I do it not just because uh, it's promotion for me but oftentimes I'm just a huge fan um, and I've just had the, pre the the pleasure and the privilege of meeting so many wonderful people. Uh, you know, like, for example, Fabrice Sapolsky, who's the co-creator of Spider-Man Noir, who you're friends with. Uh, I mm -hmm. had the honor of tabling uh, next to him at mm -hmm. Comic-Con Revolution Ontario a couple years ago before the pandemic uh, struck, struck all of us down uh, from attending conventions. And that was an amazing experience to be able to sit next to somebody that's a veteran in the industry or, you know, like Raphael, for example, who's worked on the Batman and Shaolin Showdown, which are just, you know, like some of my favorite shows. Uh, and that is a privilege. And I feel like every day that I get to do this is a huge privilege. And I just love sharing people's stuff and love seeing because it, it to me is all all fodder for inspiration. I, I, I try to take it in and grab the bits and pieces <clears> that I can and then hopefully use it uh, in my own work uh, and remix it in a way um, and, and, you know, show that, that love back to, uh, to what I have just been holding on to all this time. Um, and again, I think that's, that's a huge part of fostering and building community and leaving something for the next generation and bringing them along for the ride. Um, because it, you know, I always hear, it's really funny, I always hear the, that sort of uh, refrain of the comic book industry is dying. But honestly, people have been saying that for decades and it hasn't happened yet because there's always gonna be somebody new with a really interesting idea, an interesting story to tell from their point of view that has never been told before and hasn't been told exactly in the same way and they're going to add their nuance uh, to it. <laughs> I see Christy is sharing her screen and drawing and I'll be doing that in a bit. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's essentially why I, I suppose I, I do what I do. It's just, you know, I, I love this medium uh, that we're in so much and I feel like there's so much potential uh, and promise uh, that has happened and still is happening to this day. You know, you see projects uh, out there, you know, for example, like Jeff Lemire is killing it uh, with the Descender and Ascender. And uh, he's got some new books out or, you know, like a James Tinian uh, kind of a writer. Um, and there's new artists like Mirka and Dolpho or Tony Fleeks with Stray Dogs. Like these are comics that are just coming out and they're just like, <clears throat> grabbing the hearts and minds of people out there. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like, especially in indie comics, there will always be 
so much to mine and to absorb and to appreciate. Um, and I don't think that'll ever stop as long as people are going to be creative. Cool. Very good. Now, uh, Mr. Rafael Navarro, uh, what do you want for dinner tonight, sweetie? <laughs> <laughs> we always ship you two. <laughs> Well, I, I might have to bail out because I just um, <clears throat> got um, asked to do some caricatures for a friend at a at a, hol- a pre Halloween event in La Mirada. Go figure. But you know, I know he's lying. We're doing this on his phone. But anyway, it doesn't. It was just a joke. I'm just kidding. I don't have money to take it. Uh, <laughs> but Raph, <laughs> you've been in this uh, industry thirty years, almost thirty years. Yes. Uh, as an independent creator, first and foremost. Um, what sort of uh, changes have you seen over over the years? Like, uh, you know, from technology to the audience to, you know, you know what, what creators are capable of doing with their own careers and whatnot. Well, I think the best thing, well, I, the obvious thing has always been technology. I mean, there will, just like Don had mentioned, I mean, there will always be creators with something bold and brave and new to show uh, another generation, which might even be an old, exhausted idea to begin with, but to fresh eyes, it's, it's, it's basically water in a desert of creativity. So um, I think technology has been the best advantage for us all. I mean, we, we could do colored comic books now. We can um, do print on demand now. I remember a time when I was selling my little indie comic book, literally outside um, parking lots, you know, uh, with with my with, with my back seat uh, open there, my back trunk, you know, just selling comic books when I couldn't sell it at my local comic book shop. I also remember a time when I couldn't uh, just fathom the idea that uh, I would ever, ever be able to afford a, a, a colored comic book unless I had actually had a, a publisher to, uh, to handle all that headache that comes with it and everything or even just to learn to lay things out i mean guys check out indesign put them seriously probably the most easiest best way to lay out a book uh, and then i think that's uh, what publish uh, sorry printers tend to look for now if you could just give them a pdf of everything or or like an indesign little they're looking for like one file now not not 250 or 550 odd pages for them to sort of put together even if they're digital i mean if you become, if I, I guess technology has been helping us to become more organized, uh, which gives us more time to be creative too. So if you have other ideas to pursue, I think this would be the perfect time to do so for you have technology to back you up. <laughs> cool. So a lot of you guys probably know uh, me and Ralph of, uh, well, Best Buds, number one, but uh, we've been sharing booths together probably. I mean, longer than Guns of Blazing. Far but, too long, but, I'm afraid. Oh, oh, really? Is it like that now? But, Honeymoon's over, Chloe. Uh, uh, but we've been doing Guns of Blazing since 2013, but we were doing booths yeah, together good. with our own individual Since books. like 20... 2000, yeah, 2003, 2003, I think. Yeah, yeah, like yeah for quite some so time. So for a long time. And uh, mm-hmm. one of the things that, that I noticed and respect about Raphael is crowd interaction. So... If you're an independent creator and your name maybe isn't like Jason Momoa or the guy who played Captain America or whatever. Wait, they draw? I'm impressed. No, no but, <laughs> but what I'm saying, when you're at a convention, that's really kind of our competition. Um, and Raph always brings a crowd. I mean, it, it's it's really admirable. Did you guys find everything okay? Yeah, they're working. Okay, sorry. I do have a free Star Wars on the spinner rack over there. No, no, no. And okay, speaking of I'm attracting sorry. crowds, this guy's not so bad either, as you can see. Thanks, guys. Have fun. <laughs> May the force be with you. Um, but uh, so Raphael uh, is really good. I would say exceptionally good with uh, crowd interaction. And of course, it doesn't hurt that he, he's able to draw pretty much anything anybody asks for. I thought um, it was our guitar playing and singing. Oh, well, I mean, track we have all sorts moon, of you know. tricks up our sleeve, but... Uh, <laughs> Raph, speak to that, like, as far as, like, you're at a show, mm-hmm. you know, you don't show up in a t-shirt and jeans normally. I mean, sometimes, but uh, <laughs> you kind of treat like it, it today. <laughs> as, as what it is. Where, you know, you pay money for this booth. 
Well, um, you know, it, and it's a show. I, I've always believed in presentation. I mean, not, not that everybody should subscribe to this philosophy, but um, I approach uh, comic conventioning like uh, like I like like an old blues player. You know, you you know, you don't show up in your your, your ratty ass, you know, Mick Jagger, you know, Superman. Yes. Superman cape, you know, from the '60s, or your 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 you know beat up Batman shirt from 1989. Um, I like to wear a suit and a tie and look kind of distinctive and and you know just respectful, only because I presume that people paid money to get into this thing. You know, the last thing they want to do is is, is smell your 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 laundry and what it looked like in <laughs> your college years yeah. and everything. So <laughs> I, I I try to. I, Guess in better terms, just you know, give them a, a presentation, if you will, yeah. that that uh, reflects the art itself. Okay, and then when it comes to like commission scope, so um, maybe some of the audience <laughs> know, or maybe they don't. But when it comes to like commissions, uh, somebody wants you to draw Iron Man, or somebody wants you to draw Batman, or whatever. Uh, you know, some creators they charge, yeah, you know, it could be three hundred bucks. Some <laughs> like I have uh, one of my customers. He brought in this picture he got from Long Beach Comic Con, mm -hmm. and he's like, "Do you know who drew this?" And I was like, "I have no idea." And he's like, "Well, I paid eighty bucks for it at Long Beach." And I was like, um, "And you don't know who it is?" And he's like, "No, I just asked for a flash, and then he charged me eighty bucks." <laughs> Uh, which I, you know, I, it's kind of a swindle. Um, but Raf, so when people approach you for commissions, what's your philosophy there? I, uh, I tell them, uh, well, how much you got? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's, I, as you guys already know, I, I love to draw. I mean, I've been drawing, uh, for a living for almost pretty much 30 years. And I've been drawing for fun even longer <laughs> than that. Uh, so I will always be enamored with this wonderful craft that we uh, uh, work in and everything, this wonderful industry. So uh, safe to say it's not much of a secret when somebody asks me to draw them something. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of just looking forward to doing something, anything. If there's a monetary exchange in the, in the sort, um, I'm, I'm actually glad that something happens. But Frankly, I'd be happy just to draw just all day. Matter of fact, I'm going to be drawing again for free later during the day after this thing, too. So go figure. Yeah. But that's not necessarily mean that it's always for free. That's for sure. No, but um, all kidding aside, I mean, yes, I, I do have a list of, you know, prices, I suppose. But even then, I mean, uh, I, I like... Um, to draw on the fly, I um, depending on my inspiration, somebody might just say, "Can you just draw me a a Spider Man?" Sure, I'll draw them a Spider Man, right? And somebody says, "Can you do Doctor Strange?" I look at my watercolor set and say, "You know what? I think it's time I better crack out those watercolor sets." And frankly, it's 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 an experience for myself too. I mean, if if it thrills the uh, the soon to be owner of the artwork, you know, utterly so rest assured of if there's any love that was put into it, it was only because I was reflecting my own love for the for the craft itself too at the moment. So it's it's lucky for them if that's the case, you know. <laughs> so remember kids, give me the, the more exciting ideas as opposed to some typical face of some Harley Quinn. Yeah, yeah, please know uh, of movies of the week that came out that that Friday, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Chrissy, I'm going to hop in if you don't mind. Sure. Oh, oh, drawing. I, I, thought, I thought you had a question, Bob. No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> we're, Andrew, we're just good, doodling. Uh, questions from the crowd or any good comments, or should I just do another round with uh, the creators? Yeah, just uh, does anybody have any questions? Is Angela here? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Sorry. I'm, I'm actually under the pseudonym of Jade right now. <laughs> we're oh, playing multiple, okay. we're we playing uh, oh, musical of, chairs. Angela left the Miller room, hence the, the Miller room. Oh, their icon looks very empty. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're just that other computer is having some technical difficulties. So we're just oh, switching, okay. switching locations. Um, but anyway, so we do have a few questions. Oh, um, nice. Uh, People like, you know, what are your favorite comics and superheroes? Anybody in general, if you have any you want to suggest. Okay. Can we uh, that one with Christy first? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll start. I mean, and I Christy actually goes. liked, uh, I actually like Kay and Yuri from Dirty Pair that Adam Warren did when he did the American port of Dirty Pair. 
Uh, mm -hmm. I actually like how to make liqueur from uh, Silent Mebius. You probably have not heard of these this anime for quite no. a while. They're pretty old. Uh, and also, I like Psylocke from X Men, which is hilarious. Okay, we got to throw it out to Lawrence Hubbard too. Hey, Lawrence, Hello. what's up? Hey, well, what's his, uh, the real deal? That's his comic. Oh yeah. <laughs> or it's, uh, I thought you were asking a question or he was in the audience. Uh, I thought no, he was in the audience, it's... yeah. He might be. But... Oh, I don't think yeah, I saw no. that. Hold on. But anyway, okay. Lawrence about Real Deal. Um, Essentially, like, he does, like, a book about people in the ghetto. Like, GC is gangster cool. And there's Ace and Willie. I think Ace used to be an ex-pimp. And then there's <laughs> Chino Bill, which is, like, literally from prison. And he's, like, cr they go crazy and they kill people and they rob them and all this other stuff. And sometimes they measure like the actual news of today and there are times that there are some stories that i've actually collaborated with him about i actually did a back cover of real deal i think number eight i think that's the most recent one i'm fuzzy because it's been a while since i've actually like published published a comic but that's one of them and uh real deal so yeah real deal he did one called psyop that was actually pretty cool and there was an idea like sometimes like we'll get these random ideas and i saw one about the messed up funeral homes in the de in the south you know the ones where they had all the bodies in the oh in the, yeah they just the were south. throwing them into like yeah yeah, yeah. so and they had to be reburied as unfortunate yeah i don't want to ruin anything but i think with that guy like he's get, definitely getting a story out there pretty soon uh he also like i also curate uh, art at the hive gallery and studios and i actually what is it today is the last day you can catch it it's uh called call of the siren femme revenge and i have actually um curated that whole show his piece is in there it's uh, called pork butt smokes angel dust and thinks she's a mermaid so you can see what's there <laughs> sounds right up your alley where yeah, uh, why not right for the people who are listening huh where's the hive gallery that's at 729 south spring in downtown la cool yeah yeah, you put together a really cool show from what I, I I didn't make it to the show, but I saw it online and and yeah, it was pretty awesome. So thank you. Uh, thank you. I took the, the I took the moment to make every kind of every um wall uh other wall count because mm -hmm. there were some pieces that were so huge they had to be put on a different wall in the back. And it was mm -hmm. like, okay, well, I gotta feature these two, and they all fit together. And it was weird because it's like usually the hive will have two or three art shows going at once, you know, to break it up or whatever. Mm -hmm. But what was very strange was that, that they usually have like a regular group show and then they have, you know, the theme, one of the theme shows and then another show and two featured artists. Well, it was getting so big, my show, that everybody was submitting to it that they just said, you know, screw it. We'll just put the we'll just get rid of the group show and just put it all in and integrate it. Nice. Yeah, cool. And Don, you kind of touched on the characters that inspired you already. So, uh, Jay, do we have a, a, another question we could throw at Don? Sure. For Don, um, a, qu a question for you. What what would be a dream project for you to Ooh. work on? Uh, a dream project? Uh, there's so many dream projects. Mm -hmm. I always joke about uh, I would love it if I could get Pablo to deliver pizza to the Ninja Turtles. Uh, I think <laughs> that would be amazing. But, you know, for me, any dream project is being able to draw comics, uh, just being able to draw any, any day of the week, if you will, and get paid for it. Um, you know, ultimately, if you can walk away with something that you can show somebody, I think that is like one of the biggest highs that you can get as a creator. Um, and, you know, I've I've been honored to have been a part of uh, quite a few projects um, and a few projects that are, will be coming out soon too. So I hope uh, everybody follows along, <laughs> but yeah, you know, if, even if I could do characters that I grew up with uh, in sequential comics, uh, you know, like if I could land a, a Batman book or Spider-Man book, that would also be amazing. <laughs> uh, if I could draw, uh, Hellboy, that would be super cool, or the Ninja Turtles. Uh, so yeah, to me, it's like if I have the opportunity, any opportunity to work on any character that I love, I think that would be the ultimate joy for me. Uh, in addition to doing what I'm doing now, which is uh, working on indie projects and uh, continuing Pablo, which uh, hopefully I'll have more by the end of the year. So we'll see how that goes. Cool. What do we got from Mr. Navarro over here? 
Um, what? Hope, by the way. Okay, so, so um, what about as um, as a writer? Have you ever had writer's block, and what do you do about it? Is this for me or the writer in the room? Well, it's for one. any writer. Okay, well, uh-huh. well, let me take or it. as an let artist, what if you have artist's block? <laughs> well, 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 I'm a, well, as a writer and artist, Angela, I, I don't have anything of the sort. Believe it or not, my um, my curse uh, now is when I look at a blank page like this, I, I, I can't wait to fill it up with something, anything. It's an OCD thing. Uh, I don't know what it is, uh, but um, so long as I still have that love for doing what I do, I think I'll be okay. But um, I think the block I would probably get is that oh, I have to stop and sleep. I have to stop and pay bills. I got to stop and, you know, go do something responsible. That's my only um, hesitation to create, <laughs> which is, I guess, good for the moment. Mr. Walman. Yeah, in addition to that, I mean, gosh, writer's block. Um, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, I guess some people yeah. suffer it. Um, maybe because I, I, I don't put books out as frequently as like I don't have a monthly gig where I have to put out Spider Man every month. Uh, I have, if anything, um, writer's blockage, uh, where like I have no shortage of ideas that I want to do. You're uh, artistically. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I'm backed up. I, yeah, I'm constantly. I have a lot of ideas, <laughs> uh, you know, and um, yeah. So uh, it, it's just a matter of getting around. I mean, with with me, because I'm a self publisher, it's not just the time of day to do it, the time to write it. You know, work with an artist. And usually, I work with Raph, but I do work with other artists. Um, but it's also the resources like to, to get something out. Um, my, my main, uh, stream of income, uh, with my writing career is comic conventions, which have been on hold for almost two years. Uh, there are some happening now, but there's a lot of expenses involved in, in getting there, staying in a hotel and this and that. And, and my focus has been, uh, down here at Atomic Basement at the store here in Long Beach, uh, 400 East 3rd Street, <laughs> right down the street from the library. Um, and uh, so, you know, I have a lot of ideas. Me and Raph have two ideas that are kind of simmering. Uh, and I've got some other things, and I've got some things people have asked me to do. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just waiting for them to be ready on it. Uh, so yeah. If, if I may add to your writing uh, perspective, Mikey, from my observations, mm-hmm. from what you give me when you write for me, uh, believe it or not, uh, it's it's I don't know, for Mike, it's it's when he can spare the time because believe me, this guy's schedule is just insane between running a business and everything and everything else that has to be done before the the day is done. It's it's magical. It's it's a blessing when I get something from this man, and maybe that's probably what why I think it's very fresh and, and filled with energy and, and just, it just can't wait to be drawn to be quite frank. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, 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 it is like fine wine for a better definition. I mean, probably because he's had all this time to just work on it mentally here. Then when he was finally, when he's finally able to unleash it onto the world, finally puts it on paper mode, start, you know, it actually, it, it's, it's amazing. It, it's, uh, I, I can't draw for anything. Uh, as you saw when I tried to do your portrait earlier. Uh, so, but what I can do is, is when I write a script, I write as a communication to whichever artist I'm working with. So, uh, anyway, but yeah, next question. Let's, let's, let's send it over to Christy. All right. So for <laughs> Christy, um, do you have any recommendations on artist block or when you can't write, you know, what kind of inspiration you use and um, any other further comments on that? Well, I think for me, I think the thing is with block, you're thinking so hard with things that you're already kind of empty of at that moment. Now this will kind of make sense. So what I do, if I have artist block, I'll just start drawing random stupid things. Now people go like, well, I've had the artist block. I've had it for this many amount of time blah, blah, blah. I want to draw this epic thing. I said, okay, don't focus on the epic thing. Draw a lot of little stupid things. 
And that what that does is that it takes the importance or the thing of the thing and just kind of makes you sort of relaxed and you just draw, draw whatever. Therefore, it opens your mind up to more creative things. In general, there are times also you just have to admit yourself, I can't draw today. Like I just have nothing. So I'll just go through a bunch of lines on paper or whatever. Like you probably saw me earlier today as I was drawing, I just was drawing a bunch of like silly little things um, because it was like, I was kind of in the space of trying to get my brain into something or into a mode or wake it up. Um, for the other ones, sometimes like for other things, sometimes I'll get like a piece of song in my head or something and I'll play it over and over. I mean, that might be irritating to somebody that I'm around, but I mean, that's why I have earbuds or I'll like play like maybe a clip from a movie, like a fight scene. That's what kind of interests me or a music video, but sometimes I'll just get cat videos out and just look at them. And I know that sounds like the weirdest thing ever, but that actually puts your brain into relaxation mode, at least for me. So you're more open to things coming out. Or you take a nap, really. That, that's how it works out. That is so interesting. Or exercise, yeah. some people Cat do. Videos. Yeah. <laughs> um, Christy, uh, real quick, I know you got to leave soon. Uh, can you tell the people where you're headed, what you're doing tonight? Well, right now, tonight, I am going to Soapbox. Uh, soapbox, let me take a look. I mean, Soapbox Station, and it will be at 1407 North Arrowhead Avenue in San Bernardino. So <laughs> I'll be selling my books there as well Thanks. as different things. Yeah. So, like, come on by, take a look. We'll be there from about, I think, five to nine today. So I'll be in San Bernardino, 1407 North Arrowhead Avenue. It's a soapbox station. It's going to have like a lot of artists and everything. Is it free um, admission? Do you know? Or um, I think it may be or it's not very expensive. Like it's like bucks. it's very, very cheap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, you you do a lot of shows. Um, how do you keep that ball rolling? You know, I talk to people. I know a lot of people go like, oh, I'm, I'm looking up the prices. as I'm looking <clears> as I'm doing this. You know, I just, I generally like talk to a lot of people and sometimes it just comes to me. And I know that sounds weird to say, but the more you kind of relax, the better mm -hmm. it, everything kind of comes to you. I mean, you should put in the hard work and I definitely do like talking with people, putting together an effective campaign, all this other stuff. But sometimes you just have to let that momentum bring the things back. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, is that I was in, I had met it through another artist at the Hive Gallery, uh, Intergalactic, I'm trying to remember, Intergalactic uh, Emporium. And it, we were, it was a little pop-up, little art thing, art store and all that <laughs> over there. And then um, there was a guy there, he came up and he was just asking the other artists, hey, do you want to go to my pop-up store, pop event and everything else? And that's what he was asking us for. And he says, and that's the one for tonight, right? And all that. Yeah. So it's just sometimes just people come out of the blue to ask you mm -hmm. others. Like the thing, what I have to enunciate is, you know, you don't need to do this to people that don't treat you nicely, but you, it really costs, it, it really costs you nothing to be a decent person to people, right? Mm -hmm. You become yeah. friends with people and don't become friends with them because you're going to get something. Just be friends with them. Just be natural. And it just yeah. let it happen organically because I got to the Merced con because I got um, a referral through another friend of a friend. Like I met this person and uh, Patricia Summerlin, she's actually one of the original girls of glow. I met her through my friend, Rich Perota, who used to work for Marvel back in the day, inking and drawing. And mm -hmm. we just became all good friends. And then she referred me to this <laughs> other guy that does um, the Merced con. And now he's asked me to go to another con <laughs> to do that. That's cool. Yeah. So it's just like you, you get somewhere by knowing people you get somewhere by doing business, but in doing business, you don't have to be a jerk or you have to be cold. It's like, mm -hmm. we all know we're in it together. we all know that we're doing business together. We all know we have to support each other, but you know, at the same time, it's like, it really pays to actually be a personal individual. And I'm not saying be fake, but like mm -hmm. you're here to establish a relationship with people and that's what you're supposed to do. Like, you know, mm -hmm. here we've kind of established a relationship with Angela you know, Don, we established a relationship, you know, meeting each other at cons, getting to know each other. You and I have done that. You know, Raphael and I have done that as well. It's like with a lot of our network. Mm -hmm. We're all friends. We all say, oh, hi. We invite each other to things. That's how it works. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not it. The thing is, like, people make it overly complicated. It really isn't. You just be a good person to people and you learn and you grow. And if you have a common thing, and yes, sometimes it is just business. Sometimes it is just that that's okay to do sometimes, 
but don't be so driven. Like some of the quote unquote Hollywood people that are like, Hey, if they like you, they'll ask you to do cocaine in the back room or something. So, you know, that type of level of toxicity. Yeah. Uh, and it's not something you should take really anyway. So, um, you know, <laughs> that's you for clarifying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Believe me, it, that has been told, asked of me many, many times, apparently when I've been in LA parties and they ask me that, I'm like, and I usually say, uh, thanks, but no, but that's in, apparently how in LA they show they like you. So. Oh, okay. It's an affection. I have one more quick question for you, Christy, if you have time, like another yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, as a girl drawing gross stuff, like how did you evolve into that? How does it differentiate you <laughs> from other artists and, you know, whether man, woman, like how did you get into that? And it certainly is distinctive because I would imagine not as many girls draw that as much as maybe guys. So, and well, that's a mass generalization. Don't hurt me for saying that, but like, no, 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 no. Your view um, on that. I know it was a kind of a weird question. I know it's a weird question that I bring up a lot, but I always answer the weird questions and everything. And, you know, I was the one kind of, that kind of threw it out there because, you know, I always meet it face on anyway. Like people can ask me that question all the time, you know? Um, I think with a lot of girls, we kind of held each other or hold ourselves back. And before you say patriarchy and all this other stuff, but it's also like, I think we hold ourselves back mentally too. Like, because I think somebody will think of me of this, or because I think of the existing structure, I have to do this. And in all honesty, like a lot of the time I have just grown to not care about what people think to a point. And also most of the time I found out when I did care, most people really didn't have the time to think of me in that way. That's been my feedback of my personal life. And my mom was the type of person like she's, she was basically a real estate agent in Silicon Valley, where she graduated to the top 5% of sales by herself. She never was complaining. Like she just worked her butt off and she just did what she did. She didn't ask for anybody's permission. She just did it. She didn't get hung up on a lot of stuff. And uh, for me, the reason why I draw a lot of gross stuff, well, I had a lot of guy friends. So like a lot of guys will try to gross each other out. So I'm being a little competitive. So I'll and it's not because I'm a girl, because I just wanted to one up them. They say, oh, yeah, it's like this, this and this. I said, oh, yeah. And so I'd say it and they'd be like genuinely disturbed mentally after I was done. So <laughs> so with me, it's like I notice like girls don't let themselves draw gross things to the way that guys do. And it's not because I'm a girl or they're a guy. It's just guys just kind of naturally fall into it where girls are kind of like, well, I don't know. I don't know if I should do that because of this. I said, you're just drawing it on paper. So I kind of have now it's evolved where I actually dress really nice, but then I draw the most horrible things ever. And I think it's my little jerk way of going like, I like messing with people's skulls. So it actually makes it more interesting and more, uh, more weird or something, but I just kind of like doing it. I think that's the thing. If I'm not laughing like a jerk when I'm drawing the car cartoon, then it's not something I want to do. So it doesn't, it comes out on paper. So it's like, whatever I feel inside, it'll come out on paper. And so sometimes it's just like, I just, it's kind of like quoting Johnny Ryan, who's like the king of gross. He just said like, yeah, there are times I think that I can't, I shouldn't even do that. But then turns out I should have done it anyway. So he'll like post something uber offensive and people love it. So that's what I like about it. Cool. It's like Trisha has a question. What training classes school have folks gone through to get uh, where you are? Anybody want to take that first? Oh, I'll do it first because I have to leave pretty quick. Oh, yeah, um, yeah I, I actually went to uh, UC Santa Barbara to draw, but I have been drawing all my life. But to get any formal training, I went to get a Bachelor of Arts in Film Studies and Art Studio separately. An art studio is multidisciplinary. So I would go and I draw life study to learn multimedia to learn fine art so it was like all in one package but it was a good way to kind of get all the ideas and port the port each of those applications into how i could make them profitable or i could make them into a presentation because sometimes like with the older school artists they don't even put together a website it's like you need to so it's given me good skills in order to go and put that in the game. And then I just went into game design and I'm actually designing a game for Demon Bitch, so which is hilarious. So it's like, it's sort of all these little things are kind of adding up to get me to do it. And again, that doesn't mean I know everything about game design. It's just, I know enough to kind of get the process started. How about you, Don? What, what's your uh, team? Uh, for me, in terms of comics, I'm self-taught. 
um, and I continue to teach myself every day, but I actually did go to art school. And unfortunately for me, art school had no technical training. I went to UCLA uh, for art school, so it was all theoretical. So I actually spent most of my time at UCLA um, uh, doing sculpture and performative work, which is uh, interesting. Um, you know, I started out uh, as a lot of Asian kids do, I imagine, doing biology in pre-med, and then I hated it, um, even though I love biology. It just, UCLA wasn't the right place for me for that. Um, and I decided sometime in my junior year that I would uh, take art and try to learn something. And it was one of the most difficult things I ever did. So don't let anybody tell you that artists are lazy. Uh, I crammed a four-year program into about a year and a half, two years. And uh, it is physically intensive and grueling. Um, but yeah, I learned a lot about art history and the art world and how to think about art, which, you know, is, is important, um, not only to comics and what we do, but I think it gives a, a different understanding and perspective on how to handle things. And you do learn a little bit about, you know, a studio and the fine art market, um, and how that world is as well. So that, you know, that definitely is an eye opener. Uh, you know, and I've had the honor of being in, in shows and uh, commissions that way. Um, but yeah, in terms of comics, you know, I, I learned by reading comics and I learned from making them and doing them. Um, and, you know, you always want to look for people that you admire. And I feel like, you know, just speaking about the industry that we're in and the community that we're, we're all a part of and we're trying to grow. And like uh, Christy said, you know, in terms of the networking uh, I feel like this is one of the few industries where you could actually meet a lot of your heroes. Uh, I know people always say, don't meet your heroes, but I felt like I've met mm -hmm. a lot of my heroes and they've all been wonderful and kind to me um, for the most part. And uh, you know, that's, that's something I carry with me and I cherish and I try to pay that forward um, a lot. Uh, and, you know, you, you see with you guys, you know, like Mike, what you do for the community in terms of how you support indie uh, creators, uh, from time to comic book, all the way into you know what you're trying to do now with the Atomic Basement uh, Creator Lab. Like, you know what 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 you do is fantastic. And there, are, you're 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 building that community, and you're you're putting forth the next generation of creators to come through your shop. And you stock indie books on your shelves. I mean, you have Chrissy's book. Uh, you have Pablo the Gorilla on there. You have books from uh, you know other members uh, of the comic book creative creator collective that i'm a part of sketchy bugs um so it's it's really you know uh, that's that's the retailer end too you know of, of supporting and growing this foundation of the medium that we're in um and you know that that adds to my education like every time i see a new creator doing something cool you know i, I want to learn about what they're doing and how they do it um and i i, I keep seeing new influences you know pre people bringing in uh like for example i'll bring in some of my graffiti background uh and admiration for graffiti as well as you know any manga or anime influence and chrissy i know you have a little bit of the same too and then you have like this you know really expressionistic style as well and i think you know we we all carry and implement these tools that we pick up uh along the way so i don't think we ever stop learning no uh, no and speaking of, I actually have to just take this brief because I don't want to interrupt anybody. I do have to go, but it's been fun talking to you guys and being with you guys on a panel. And if you have any questions, they, they will be putting my information up there too. So to contact yeah, thanks me. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you Mike. Me. And we'll be including the links in the chat too for people. Okay. Thank All right. you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you us. so much. Thanks. Have a great we'll show, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Back, back to what you were saying earlier, Don, about, you know, fostering a creative community. Uh, you know, I moved here from North Carolina with no idea what the heck I was doing, how to do it, how to go about it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, kind of pretty much learned the hard way. Uh, and, and, you know, I st I'm still not perfect. I'm still learning. Um but uh, that community started with the creator groups. And, I, and so we were having signings like with people like Richard Starkings, who's like the number one premier letterer in the industry, yeah. you know, Mike Mignola, these people. And, and uh, you know, 
people that aspire to be creators would come and, and listen and learn and, and things like that. And then it kind of, you know, I, I think it was uh, Don Walker and a couple other guys who were like, uh, you know, we're sitting here and we're listening and we're learning, but we're not really making comics. And that was how, that was the seed of, of what became Sketchy Bugs. Um, but what makes me proud is like, I knew you, uh, I think you did a, a, that book with Andy Norville. It wasn't a comic book. It was more like a, a poetry book or something. Yeah, it was a prose book. We, we did, um, we were the first team to take all 31 of Jake Parker's prompts in 2017 mm -hmm. for Inktober. And we created a continuous story from beginning to end with all 31 prompts. And amazingly, right. the book went number one on Amazon Kindle, top 100 uh, in print. And, uh, you know, that was, that was a huge honor, but yeah, we, we did 31 plates of art and Andy wrote 31 chapters in 31 days. And that's, that's kind of how I broke, uh, into the scene, uh, you know, yeah. with comics and, you know, part of that, you know, in terms of talking about meaty heroes, you know, part of the inspiration behind that was, um, you know, I got to know Dustin Wynn, two-time Eisner winner. Everybody knows him from little Gotham and detective comics. Uh, he mm -hmm. won obviously for his watercolor painting, uh for descender and he's on uh, ascender with jeff lemire now they're going to be launching batman and robin soon through mm -hmm. dc you know i he got to know me and he would see my artwork and every time i was catching him at the show he would be like hey are you putting anything out and that that really gave me the impetus to <clears throat> start putting out my work because he would see it and to me you know i i about 10 years ago i decided uh that i wanted to be in this industry be a part of this industry become a comic book artist um and i didn't really know how to go about it and then you know from him saying that i sort of just realized that it's about putting yourself out there and putting work out there so that other people can see it so the mm -hmm. the greatest bit of advice that i could give anybody <laughs> is to make comics if you want to be in comics just make comics and put them out there and get other people to see them and you never know it it can come down to just one fan of your work who just loves it so much that they're, you know, they're willing to put themselves out there and promote for you. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful that I have a lot of people who, uh, you know, who are coming on board, whether that be because of the Inktober book, whether that's because of Pablo the Gorilla or the design I did for uh, Jerry Conway, like, you know, they're, they're now with me and they're, they're very supportive. And I, I, I greatly appreciate that, but yeah, yeah it, it all starts in one place. Right. And that place to me is like, you, you really do have to, to put yourself out there and get, get your work out there. Yeah. I remember the day you came in to the shop, you know, back, I don't know, four years ago, maybe yeah. uh, and you had your first bag of boarded copy of Pablo and uh you, you gave it to me and i was i was really touched and honored um i don't take credit for that <laughs> <laughs> I, I did get a free sketch out of you on the back cover i think and and you know a friendship that's continued on um but there was another customer uh don borgmeyer i think you know him yeah don just put out uh his his uh comic on kickstarter like you know that's oh did he? fantastic okay. resource that we have now yeah well, he's got his first issue out and, and, but he was a, uh, he was a subscription pull customer at, at my old store and he came in and, and, uh, he was like, yeah, I think I want to do a comic book. And I just like, do it, man. And then he started, he put himself to it, he started coming to the creator meetings. He found himself fantastic. Cause he's a, like me, he's a writer. He, he's not an artist, although he is actually honing his, his art skills. Um, but he found, yeah, he found himself a great artist. He put out a really touching book about a, a little kid in an orphanage that. Yeah, has, Bart Bartson. Yes, thank you. Shout out to Zon. I, the, the name wasn't coming to me, but I, I've read it a couple times. It's really good. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's not like, oh, yeah, I made that guy's career or anything like that. But it's like, oh, you know, some pe sometimes people just need a little spark, you know, or a little push into the, into the pool, swimming pool. The water's warm, you know? Um, so that that's what makes me feel good about the community that, that we have here in LA. And and that's why I want to do the, you know, Creators Lab once things are a little more safer to be together like we used to be, you know? Yeah. Speaking of Creators Labs and your Creators Lab and also just creating, um, we've been watching 
Don sketching here for a good part of the last you know, bit of the discussion. And you have this graphic design program at Sketchbook. Maybe now's a good opportunity to just talk a little bit about the different graphic design programs or um, other programs that you would recommend, software applications for whether free or paid um, for people who are getting started or who are interested in learning more. Uh, so uh, part of my Inktober uh, presence is through Autodesk Sketchbook. Actually, they they promoted, um, you know, they've promoted Inktober uh, in the past, and I was part of that. And they uh, promoted my work uh, through Siren Song, so we we were able to get some visibility to that. So I, I will always love Autodesk Sketchbook. It's a free program. You can download it on almost any platform. It's available. I'm on a PC right now, and I use a Wacom Cintiq. But I also use it on my phone. I use it uh, to do all of my thumbnails and my layouts uh, before I up-res it and take it to final pencils and finishing. Um, so I, I personally use mm -hmm. Autodesk Sketchbook. I have a lot of friends that also use uh, Clip Studio. Mm -hmm. um, they have sales uh, for that every year. And I think they're, it's at about $60. Uh, uh, excuse me. $60 for the full app. And that's a fantastic uh, application as well because that not only allows you to draw but it sort of mixes elements of both Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator so it allows you to vectorize images as well. I personally uh, the most intuitive program for me is Sketchbook uh, also it's free which is right up my alley because I, I love things that are free uh, so I use that in conjunction with the Adobe uh, suite so I do uh, all of my layouts and stuff from my phone on Sketchbook, and then I up it, and I do finishing uh, and inking in uh, Sketchbook on the desktop. And then I take my pages and I move that into Photoshop to do uh, any coloring, uh, flatting work that needs to be done. And for flatting, uh, anybody out there who doesn't know how comics work, we start with pencils, uh, then we fine tune our pencils, then uh, that goes into inking, which is what I'm doing now with this Hulk drawing. Uh, and then from there, uh, usually colors. <laughs> and if you're an indie creator, you most likely do all of these parts, uh, like myself. You then flat the work, which is you block out the colors and you block out all the shapes uh, to make it a little more easy <coughs> to render uh, in coloring. And then uh, coloring, because we live in a wonderful uh, age of technology, as Raphael was mentioning, uh, we now can do that all digitally and, uh, you know, in this day and age, as Mike uh, was saying with uh, Don Borgmeier and myself, we, I'm a huge proponent of crowdfunding and Kickstarter. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, I talk about crowdfunding all the time. I love to promote and uh, support uh, Kickstarter because that in itself is a community. Um, so, you know, we, we, there's Venn diagrams in the comic book world and, uh, you know, Kickstarter definitely uh, fits in there, and you know, there's uh, Indiegogo is another is another uh, huge platform that people crowdfund on, um, and yeah, so uh, I, I think we live in a wonderful time where you have all of these uh, applications and utilities at your hand, and you can do this because, like, 15, 20 years ago, this wasn't a possibility that you could go and have people see your work and support your work in this method, um, you know. Uh, the, the story I always tell is the Ninja Turtle story, right? Like Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird had to use their own money to print out uh, 10,000 copies of their comics. And nowadays you can have people see your work and support you and get your work just by doing a Kickstarter. And, you know, then they receive your work and you're able to put your work out there and then carry your work from show to show. Um, and it's an amazing, amazing resource to have. But yeah, so uh, my phone that I use, I use a Samsung Galaxy uh, series phone. I've been with Samsung since the Note 2. I'm now on the Note 9. And uh, yeah, so once everything is colored, we do that in Photoshop. And then for lettering, uh, that's where all the speech balloons come in and the narration balloons and thought bubbles. Uh, I used to do that in Photoshop, but I have to say anybody out there, it's way easier to do it in Adobe Illustrator. I know a lot of people who are in Clip Studio uh, paid also use the vector, uh, the vector um, tools that they have to get that done as well. So those are probably the biggest tools. Um, and if you're on an iPad Pro, I know a lot of people also use Procreate. And I think those are probably, that's probably the top tier of all the applications that you'll be able to find 
uh, on any of the platforms. That's awesome. It's really impressive what you guys can do. Um, just a quick question, because we've got, it's about 424. We've got about six minutes no, until 413. the official. Pardon me? It's only 413. Oh, 413. Though. Amazing. A computer clock that's incorrect. <laughs> oh, wow. Don't wow. So yeah. we still have even more time. That's even great. Um, so, still going right now. <laughs> so we, oh, good. So I just was wondering, you know, if you guys would be down for this, but um, we can keep on talking and asking questions, but would you want to do like little one minute sketch battles or something like just do, I don't know, just do something on the fly, like one or two well, minutes well, at a time, see what you can come up with. Well, sure. I wouldn't call or it do a drawings battle. for people who have recommendations in the audience. But I would love, <laughs> sure. I, I would love to take requests. Sure. Why not? But, I, but I'm not in competition with, the, with my dear pal Don there. Besides, no, I mean, no, no. Just for the time frame. Just that's what I mean. Just like a little countdown, like one or that. two minutes. We lose or draw. We lose or yeah. draw. There you go. Perfect. Whatever you want to call it. Okay. Well, All right. Mike just bamboozled me to draw this for you too, Milady, because I'm presuming you are a fan of this particular Amazonian. Oh, yay. Yeah, we have okay. two fans in the room over here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Maybe we'll have you two fight for that one. Huh? Awesome. I should request them to, to make a Billy Jean King uh, Wonder Woman fight. But oh, I might have I reference know. to that. Yeah. <laughs> also, might like have, that. So or if you want to draw uh, your audience. favorite superheroes, like ones that, you know, your favorite superheroes that you grew up with. I don't know if that's something that She's comics... She's one of my but, favorite superheroes. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, I, I don't know her. if, um, you know, if that's... Do you guys start drawing your favorite superheroes initially is that kind of how you know some of your art developed in the beginning or did you just do your own sketching personally like what in, whatever inspired you do you want to start first or shall i yeah i think for comics uh you know if you're you're into comics and you're into cartoons you gravitate towards what you consume the most right so <laughs> growing up for me that would have been batman superman spider-man i think uh, if you're a kid out there, that that's probably what you go for uh, if that's what you're consuming, especially in th this day and age with all the movies uh, from Marvel and DC mm -hmm. that are out. Uh, but also, you know, any cartoon characters that you love. And, you know, there I remember going to the library and there were how to draw cartoon characters. And the one that I would draw the most, which is funny because I actually have never read it, was uh, the Phantom. For whatever mm -hmm. reason, I just love the character design of the Phantom yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, the from the mask to the purple hood like that just stood out and there was a how to draw like your favorite comic book characters and that was one of the characters that I, I remember gravitating towards and then you know the book that any any comic book creator probably my age a little bit older and a little bit younger will swear by is how to draw comics the marvel way and when you pick that book up you go beginning to end trying to copy <laughs> all the john uh, busama stuff all the jack kirby artwork in there and Sal Buscema and John Romita, uh, all those amazing guys that were in the Marvel bullpen uh, back in the day, uh, Gene Colan. So, you know, I, I think you you start by using whatever you consume, by drawing whatever you consume visually, and the world around you. You know, my family always tells me that I started drawing around two, and I was drawing houses and cars <laughs> that were, like, in the front and things that I would observe uh, and birds. So, you, you know, you... Basically, you just have to start somewhere. And if that's what you like, then that's what you go with. Um, that's awesome. Someone just said, Phantom, Mandrake the Magician, and draw Iron Man looking awesome. Yeah, you have requests already. So draw <laughs> oh, Iron Man really? looking okay. awesome. Okay. Or Phantom and Mandrake the Magician. I think do the Phantom. Oh. And I think Raph should maybe do Iron Man. Um, what about the other way around? <laughs> yeah, we can do the other way around, too. I, someone, I think Trisha had asked about, uh, do any of us get into graphic novels? Well, actually, Mike, your book kind of is at this point, because you guys have, was it five or six issues of Guns of Blazing? We and have then, six issues, uh, yes, and, and it's a complete story, um, and it will be collected, but uh, as you know, in publishing, that, that costs money. I mean, we even have an intro uh, that, that my friend wrote for the the beginning I, it, it really sums it up about mm -hmm. because we started that book in 2013 i think the last issue came out in 2019 yeah so essentially uh it was a reflection each issue you can't help but be um 
influenced by the outside world. And, uh, you know, it's a very chaotic book. Let's put it that way. I mean, it's fun because we tried to instill the, uh, the, the spirits of Mike and Raph into it. Uh, but I was, I was in therapy. <laughs> Funny story. Uh, I was, I was in therapy around the time issue four or five came out and, and uh, my therapist asked to read it. And so I brought her a set and she's like, wow, this is just pure chaos. <laughs> and she's like, I think it's a reflection of you. <laughs> so, but, uh, but anyway, um, you know, graphic novel, comic book, uh, you know, I, I think trade paperback, they're all different words for the same thing, really. Um, ultimately, I think my de the, my definition for a graphic novel would be something that comes out as one book that's like more than a you know a floppy comic. Like they call Watchmen a graphic novel, and it's like, no, girlfriend, that was a that was a twelve issue series <laughs> back in the eighties, you know. Yeah. But, but graphic novel gives it. It's like uh, it's a pretentious. You know, word. you you could call something grilled cheese, or you could call something fromage. You know, uh, <laughs> on toast. You know, uh, croque monsieur is the, uh, the something French like term that. Yeah. I don't really know if anything. I'm making stuff up, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> ultimately, it's the same thing. You know, the same sort of uh, uh, rules apply. Uh, the difference for me between a comic book and a graphic novel is, uh, you know, you want to get people coming back for a comic book. You know, you want to leave a, a cliffhanger or something that your your readers can't wait to see what happens next. And they might have to wait a month. In our case, they might have to wait a year. Uh, and, um, and a graphic novel is, is kind of one and done. You sit down, you read it. There's, you know, there's different, there, there's pluses and minuses to each. Um, the same with, you know, a lot of, a lot of people try to, you know, they try to get their movies made and, and that doesn't work out. And so then they want to turn it into a graphic novel because they see all these genuine comics and graphic novels getting adapted in the film. So just because you see that doesn't mean your screenplay has been rejected 18 times all around Hollywood turn it into a graphic novel it worked for cowboys and aliens it worked for cowboys and aliens. <laughs> but, uh, you know yeah. it it's really two different mediums and, and uh that's, that's something i always try to um express to like potential clients that that have approached me to edit their script into a comic book or a graphic novel it's like well you know a lot of the stuff like if you it, you guys all know Kevin Smith, right? I, I, he, he's great. I think he's a great screenwriter. Uh, not everybody agrees with me, but he's really good at dialogue. Really good. And and you know that dialogue is interpreted by actors. Um, but when he writes a comic book, oh my god! Like, uh, hopefully the artist will find a, a little place in the panel or page where he can draw the picture of who's talking because. Kevin's a very verbose writer, and I uh, I'm not so certain that he understands the craft of writing comic books. Mm -hmm. Just like I don't understand the craft of writing novels, you know. Like um, I, you know, I don't I don't have the patience. You know, comics are uh, they're really for me. I mean, not not every comic, but the kind of comics I write and the kind of comics I enjoy are the ones that are you know, short attention span theater, you know? So I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there are comics that are created to be graphic novels straight <laughs> off the bat. Like people will do 64 pagers, 60 pagers, all the way up to 100, 200 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a magnum opus style uh, of doing a graphic novel. And what we're more familiar with in the comic book collecting community is you see story arcs that are collected into what they call trade paperbacks. Yeah. And then through time, because of how it's consumed, uh, you know, on that individual basis as a trade paperback, that then becomes a graphic novel 
uh, specifically known in that format, like you were mentioning with The Watchmen or V for Vendetta. Both were limited series, and then both have uh, lived on in that particular graphic novel format because uh, I think it endures a little bit better uh, in the graphic novel format, uh, you know, because people can consume it all at once. Whereas very serialized stories uh, may not be seen that way. So, you know, you tend not to think of a lot of superhero stories uh, in a graphic novel format like that. Um, you know, like you, you, think it's, uh, you think it's kind of more of a, like when you talk about like Watchmen, V for Vendetta, Dark Knight Returns, uh, do you think it's more of a marketing term? Like, so like when people see the movie trailer or whatever, like from the graphic rather than from the comic book. I think, you know, there, there is a little bit of that because, uh, you know, comic books have always been seen in, in, the, in the fine art world as what you would call a, a low form of art, mm -hmm. um, which is funny because, you know, Jack Kirby, I believe in 1999, got recognition in art form, um, which is a fine art magazine uh, that used to be around back in the day. And I, I always thought that was funny. You know, all of a sudden you see these really popular uh, pop artists, if you will, such as Jack Kirby or Nom a Norman Rockwell getting recognition for their work. Uh, whereas, you know, if you really think about art, art is truly subjective. Um, and a lot of the art theory that is, you know, what you, you read, consume in terms of institution, that's that's based on, you know, a criticality that is simply assigned by a person, usually a, a white male, if you will. Uh, and that has really uh, been assailed over the last few years, um, you know, especially, you know, the Me Too movement and everybody, you know, wanting to break that glass ceiling and bring down the patriarchy that that now is like a topic of discussion and then you you really do have to view things through a different lens and uh you know it i, I feel like we now are in that day and age where we can do that and discuss things but yeah i i feel like you know when the term graphic novels came about it was because comics wanted to be taken a little bit more seriously in terms of a form of literature and, you know, you see things like the Watchmen uh, on the SAT list. Uh, Watchmen is chock full of fantastic vocabulary and prose. Uh, and it's only it's only right. But, yeah, to, to break that that stereotype of a low form of art, um, I, I think that's that's what led to the term being coined. Yeah, I think Will Eisner was the first one to use it, but I'd have you guys have to fact, fact check me. Yeah, um, I believe I, you know, Will speaking did. the lowbrow um, term of comic books, like Stan Lee, Stan Lee uh, you know, the great Stan Lee, Marvel Comics, he, you, he, his name was actually Stan Lee Lieber, uh, but he was a little bit embarrassed at first to be a comic book writer because it was seen as lowbrow. And, and but he did want to be an author, so he went by the name Stan Lee, yeah, uh, because he wanted to save his real name, Stanley Lieber, for uh when he wrote the first great American novel. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, it, uh, and the 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 perception of, of this medium has changed over the years. Um, I think that uh comic book shops and direct market has helped that as far as um you know we did, uh, back i don't know in the 80s 70s 60s there was the comics code of approval so anything that came out it was to be distributed on newsstands had to go through this committee and there there was a lot of things you couldn't put in comic books yeah the comics code authority yeah 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 is that what I, that's what i said right or did i call it something else no, um, you're just saying the, the group, but the name, I was just saying the name specifically. Yeah, yeah. For those so, who don't you know. know. But then when Direct Market came along, then you started getting things like, uh, you know, like Dark Knight and things like that, where they didn't care. Actually, there were three issues of Spider-Man back when newsstand distribution was happening before comic shops, which 96, 97, and 98 were the issue numbers. Um, and his buddy was on drugs. And <laughs> yeah, it, it was the message was don't do drugs. It wasn't like, hey, kids, 
you know, let's do drugs. It was, it was an anti-drug thing, but the fact that there was drug use in it, um, this, the comics code authority, uh, declined it. And Stan Lee said, no, we're going to put it out anyway. So, and I don't know what the distribution was. Yeah. There was no code on this. Issue. I, oh, just have a, oh, I just wanted to pop in cause it's, uh, we've only got about two minutes left. You guys oh, are sorry. doing an amazing <laughs> job. No, no, this is great. Um, just in our last few minutes, I don't know if anybody had, Oh, quick sketches. Yeah. Hold that up close to the camera there so we can see that. Mike. Is that good? Oh my gosh. That's awesome. There's your Iron Man. I got a fancy. Oh, there's your Iron Man. And then, um, so just maybe just 30 seconds each person. Um, what would you say is the best advice you've ever received in comics? Um, something that you could fast, you know, forward to everybody else to take away from today's talk. If they want to get started in this business. You want to be in comics? Make comics. That's really the, the long and the short of it. <laughs> Uh, there's really nothing else to do but to make them. Uh, and I feel like, you know, for for me, it was, once again, Dustin Wynn just told me, hey, do you have anything? And that was what got me, you know, the fire under my seat to get me to put work out there. So, yeah, if don't be shy about it. If you, if you want to be here and you want to be doing this, uh, make work, show your work to people that you like, get feedback. I go to portfolio reviews still, and I show people that are way better than me my work. And, uh, you know, I've had the honor of showing my work to artists like uh, Steve Epstein or uh, Brian Stelfreeze or Raphael, for example. Uh, if you can <laughs> track it down over there at Atomic Basement um, and show it to editors, you know. Um, like we have Barbara Kiesel, who's an amazing editor, friend of the shop uh and and mike's friend like i've shown her my work and you know it's that's what it takes for you to get to the next level if that's if that's what you want to be doing if you want to be working in an editorial style of you know a dc or a marvel um it, it's just you know to get your work out there put your work out there share it on social media um yeah i can't i can't emphasize that enough because i feel like that's that's what we're doing here is you know we're just putting out work someone said zatanna so i'm trying to hammer out a quick zatanna <laughs> <laughs> nice you've nice. got phantom happening over here yeah i don't uh, I'm, my sincerest apologies buddy i didn't see you were actually drawing an iron man there so i <laughs> and, and oh that's all right super no it's fast. all good it's just different yeah. variations all excellent Listen, um, so we've got about one minute left, and oh, no. I just want to take this opportunity to say that <laughs> if uh, if people have more questions or interest in, you know, comics, manga, comic book art and artists, other topics along these lines, uh, we definitely have lots of resources in our library collection. We have a huge manga collection. Um, so please check out our online catalog on our website or drop on by the library here at uh, Billie Jean King Main Library or at any of our 11 branch libraries that would be wonderful we'd love to see you um and are if you for some reason you, now? pardon me are you open to the public oh we are all of our locations are open oh great okay yeah cool. except for alamitos which is still uh go undergoing some renovations but all of our other branches are open in our main library um and if you guys have any further questions in the chat or um Anything that you'd like to reach out and inquire with uh, with our guest panelists today or Mike, our moderator, um, feel free to include your questions in the chat or just whatever you'd like. Oh, there we go. It's another. Oh, that's great. <laughs> just include any comments in the chat that you'd like to add and we will uh, get those um, forwarded along. For Christy, too, she's not here, but we'll forward any of that information along. And then um, I will be sending out a link uh, via email in probably within the next week. And I will include actually everybody's contact information, you know, their websites, Instagram accounts, Facebook, what have you. We're having just a little bit of technical difficulties on this end. So I can't show you that final slide that I wanted to show you with everybody's contact info. But it's, it's 4.30 now, so we're going to need to conclude our program. And uh, oh, I love that. Thank you, Don, so much. But I want to thank all of you and Mike Wellman and our talented comic book artists and writers for joining us today, for sharing your time and your generous 
talent with our um, providing educational enrichment for our Long Beach Public Library community. And many nope. thanks to our library administration, our staff, um, friends of the library, our foundation, many other mm -hmm. local contacts for helping to promote this event. And then finally, we really want to thank all of you, our wonderful guests, for joining us today for this Artist Workshop Series program. We do it for you. So our sincerest thanks and appreciation to everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Everybody stay safe and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you again soon with more upcoming programs for the Miller Room and the Long Beach Public Library. Thanks so much again, everybody. And did you guys have anything you wanted to add? So I want to say thanks for comments? having us. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us. And, and uh, yeah, it's an amazing um, library. Go check it out. Lots of great comic books and graphic novels. And it's awesome. So what do you say? Thank you, and Angela. Don't, don't don't forget to stop by Atomic Comics Bookstores just down the street. Atomic Basement Comics. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Make a day of it. <laughs> yeah, just down the street from us. Great partnership. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and sharing your incredible talent um, with all of our audience. We're so pleased to have you. Everybody, you. have a wonderful evening. Thanks again. We'll see you soon. Thank Anytime. you. Anytime. Bye. Bye, -bye.